Welcome back to the second annual Global Climate Restoration Forum. I'm your host, Rick Parnell, the president and CEO of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Yesterday, we learned about the science behind climate restoration, the role the oceans play in restoring the climate, and the natural and technological solutions that make climate restoration possible. Earlier today, we learned about the multi-trillion dollar economic opportunity of climate restoration. It was a really engaging conversation. In short, we learned that not only is climate restoration technically possible, but there are both market solutions and investors that can make carbon removal at scale a reality. Underpinning all of this potential is the urgent pressure for action being mobilized by engaged citizens around the world. Thanks to leadership from some incredible young people, faith leaders, women and girls organizations, and NGOs, among others, we are seeing an inspired global community demanding action to reverse the impacts of climate change. In this next session, we will hear from voices leading the movement behind restoring the climate and also learn how climate action is not an isolated movement. We will also hear about the importance of intersectionality and how climate action must be a part of broader social justice demands in order to ensure a better, better world for all of us. Before we start the session, let me say again a very special thanks to our forum underwriters, the Peter J. and Sharon D. Fikowski Trust, and our friends at Guggenheim Partners. Without their support, the forum just would not be possible. Co-moderating the movement discussion will be my colleague Kai Young, who is CEO of Social Impact Partners. Kai is a key strategist for the foundation. And Ashley Meeky, Ashley is a freshman at Vanderbilt University and a member of the Foundation for Climate Restoration Board of Directors. Before I turn it over to Kai and Ashley, we have a short video from some tremendous climate restoration champions. Let's take a look. I got involved around organizing for climate action because I've personally been impacted by the climate crisis. My family in the Philippines has been devastated by natural disasters, including Typhoon Haiyan. And just this summer, I watched my country burn in some of the most devastating bushfires we've ever seen. And I started understanding better the gap that we were having and the distractions that we were causing. And it became more of my, my goal to make a certain impact or a certain minimum change that could speak to, to addressing these challenges that I faced. For me, my climate action and my climate sort of efforts really started with first stop gaining an awareness. And it was surprising, it, this issue was never really brought up in my high school curriculum or in my curriculum growing up in general. Um, my main outlet for discovering information about this topic was through social media or different news networks where you were able to literally see footage of the devastating effects that climate change is having on different areas around the world. What motivated me personally to be standing for climate action and to be a climate activist and to be a culprit for positive change in the world, I have been raised by someone who in the 90s decided she was going to trademark eco fashion and has been part of the sustainable fashion movement since the very beginning. So restoring climate to me, it means um, more than what it is to many people. To me, it's more like a purpose now. So it's something that I live for day in, day out, because I know the impact that this climate change has on our lives, on our day-to-day -day lives, the impacts that it has on my family, on my community, on my country, and this entire world. For me, restoring the climate not only means mitigating environmental harm, it also means restoring a safe future for my generation and those generations which follow me. Climate restoration means my home won't burn every summer. We need to go beyond emission reduction and net zero and get to net negative, which is how we restore our climate back to a place where all of us and the planet can live without the harmful effects from climate change. We actually have the ability and the possibility of literally making a difference and restoring our climate as it was 800,000 years ago back to healthier times. I advocate for climate restoration, the process of removing excess CO2 from the atmosphere to restore the earth back to safe and healthy levels. 
I know that this is a critical piece of the antidote to the climate crisis we're facing. As communities, we can't do anything by ourselves, or as individuals, we can't do anything by ourselves. But what this climate crisis has taught us, most importantly, is the fact that climate change is a global crisis and it goes beyond the boundaries that we have, the geographical boundaries, but it's something that affects us as a globe. So we are more like globalization towards action on climate change. So I would say a movement is something that is really powerful. Especially nowadays with the majority of my peers now being able to vote, they can vote for legislators um, and representatives that will fight for their opinions and for their viewpoints on restoration um, and just climate change in general. I believe in the power of young people to organize and instigate positive change. We're not going to stop fighting until we see our climate restored and we see a safe future. We are the first generations to see the impacts of climate change and the last generation that can stop it. As Broadway Green Alliance so brilliantly puts it, raising the curtain on the climate crisis and taking one small action as individuals to make a change as a collective and not feel like it's too unattainable and not feel like it's not our job and, and not feel like we have no power to make a difference. Hi, everyone. My name is Kai Young, Senior Advisor at the Foundation for Climate Restoration, and I'm beyond thrilled to be joining this panel today. I've seen that video dozens of times, and I'm amazed each time by how thoughtful and energized and commit committed this group of young people are in ensuring that we have a healthy planet for them to survive. As Danielle mentioned in the video, we are the first generation to see the impacts of climate change and the last generation that can stop it. These are sobering words, to be sure. And we're currently seeing a movement that is indeed acting as if their lives depend on it. This session will pick up on the notion of building a movement in this specific moment, and we're fortunate to have such a powerhouse panel. As Rick mentioned, moderating the session will be my colleague, Ashley Miki. In addition to her work with F4CR, Ashley is also an advocate for inclusivity, women's empowerment, and domestic violence awareness. She volunteers with the South Suburban Family Shelter, Habitat for Humanity, and Progressive Housing. Beyond all this, she also operates her own natural hair care cup business called Hair Chronicles by Ashley. Just amazing. Joining Ashley will be three powerful women in their own right. First, we have Melissa Kilby, the executive director of Girl Up. Girl Up is the global leadership development organization that is transforming a generation of girls to be a force for gender equality and social change. Proud to say Girl Up is also a new F4CR partner. Melissa joined Girl Up in its first year and has built the organization into the force that it is today. She was recently named as one of Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40, a title given to 40 influential leaders under the age of 40. We're very fortunate to have her with us today. Alongside Melissa will be Lindsay Levin. Lindsay is the CEO of Leaders Quest and a founding partner of Countdown, another F4CR partner. Lindsay has dedicated her life to reshaping what leadership looks like. Her work explores our collective humanity through vulnerability and listening. She calls herself a serial entrepreneur and in 2001, she founded Leaders Quest as her last startup to help leaders and companies align profits with purpose. Following the Paris Climate Agreement, she co-led the launch of Future Stewards, which is a coalition working to build a regenerative future where we meet the needs for all within the means of the planet. And last year, Future Stewards teamed up with TED to create Countdown a global initiative to champion and accelerate solutions to the climate crisis, turning ideas into action. This initiative launches on 10, 10, 20, and we'll be hearing more about this in the forthcoming panel. And last, but certainly not least, is my pleasure to welcome Alexandra Villasenor. At the age of 13, Alexandra co-founded the US Youth Climate Strike Movement. And now at age 15, Alexandra has become an internationally recognized environmental activist public speaker, author, and founder of many several more initiatives, including the climate education focused on profit and F4CR partner, Earth Uprising International. If her name and face are familiar to you, that means you've been paying attention. She recently addressed the Democratic, the Democratic National Convention regarding the urgency of the climate crisis 
and has spoken at the UN and the World Economic Forum. For her work, Alexandra has received numerous awards and was included in Politico's top 100 people influential in climate change policy. Truly, I'm in awe of all four of these women. Now, before I hand it over to Ash, I just want to remind you all that if you have any questions, we will have time to answer them. Uh, please do enter those questions directly into the Zoom Q&A link, and uh, we'll have a few minutes to hopefully answer all these questions. So please don't be shy and ask away. And with that, allow me to hand it over to you, Ashley. Over to you. Hi, super excited to be here with you all and talk about the growing movement of climate restoration. So let's get right into it. We heard about how some climate action movements have gained momentum and how climate restoration played a role in that. I'd like to take a step back and discuss movement building more broadly. We've seen a significant rise in civic engagement in 2020. My first question is to Melissa and Lindsay. Can you describe some of the pivotal steps that really built the movements you've created? I can start, Lindsay, if that works for yeah, you. Yeah, go for it. Perfect. Um, well, thank you, Ashley, so much. And just want to say we're so excited to be a new partner in this work. And, and climate is maybe new to Girl Up, but certainly not to the girl leaders that have been building this movement. So to, to just share a little bit about how we have built Girl Up into a movement and, and what that has meant, um, it's really about an idea. It's about who is the audience, who is the group that you're trying to pull together, and what is it that they care about? You know, when we launched Girl Up, we cared about adolescent girls, about making sure that their lives could be equal, that they could reach their opportunities and fulfill their dreams and that they wouldn't be held back just because they were a girl. You know, over the last 10 years, what we have done right in building this movement is listening to the girls along the way. It's only been 10 years, but girls have changed a lot. Young people have changed a lot. Activism has changed a lot. The world has changed. And with that, so has Girl Up. So I think, you know, when, when it has been about how do you get an idea, a concept, a campaign, and build it into a global movement, um, it, it is about being authentic to the community that you have built this platform and this movement for. So that would be my, my sort of number one piece of advice. And I think our success has also come from evolution. We are not the same organization that we were three years ago, let alone 10 years ago. And that's a good thing because the world is changing. Young people are changing. Social media has changed the game, but also the rise of youth voices and the way that the world has actually started to listen to young people has changed the world. And so really as a movement, we're trying to keep up and we're trying to make sure that we're turning our focus to the issues that our movement actually cares most about. That has been really crucial um, to the success of the movement that we've built at Girl Up. Wonderful, Melissa, let me, let me build on that. I'd also just begin by saying it's a real honor to be with you all. So I'm, I'm thrilled, Alexandra, Melissa, Ashley, to meet you and to be in this conversation with you and, and to be meeting all those who are listening in today. Um, I mean, if I think about the work that we've specifically done around climate and the planet and how that's built, if I go back to the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, I was very close to a number of the people who played leadership roles in that, including people like Christiana Figueres, who, who was leading on climate for the UN. And they got to the end of that historic agreement um, and everyone was unsurprisingly exhausted. And one of my observations at the time was about the kind of leadership, what does it mean to be sustainable as leaders? Interesting question also for all you, you know, next generation leaders in this space. How do we take care of ourselves in order to be able to lead change, which actually has, has to happen over the long term? Um, and so we, that was when I formed Future Stewards. I basically started to build a collaboration of more and more organizations focused on the leadership to address these kinds of challenges. And, one of the sort of central themes for us is that if you want to help change the world, you have to be perpetually prepared to change yourself. So actually the things that we see in the outside world are also a reflection of what's going on inside for all of us as human beings. And, and, and to change our relationship with nature and the planet, we, we need to change our relationship with one another and, and with actually within ourselves. 
So, you know, one theme uh, in, in the build-up of our work is, is this idea of leadership and a personal change if you want to see systemic change. I meant to just build on that and just mention briefly Countdown, I'll say a little bit more about it later, but um, back kind of early last summer in 2019, I sat down with Chris Anderson, who's the CEO of TED, and you've probably all come across TED Talk and TEDx, just at a point when he was thinking about TED stepping into doing something very proactive on climate change. And I had been doing all of this work through Future Stewards. I'm entrepreneurial by nature. And I said, you know, I think we can do this together. So it's a, a big theme for us is how do you build collaborations across sectors to work together on these complicated issues? In the case now of TED Countdown, we've got some 50 odd partner organizations working on that. We're open to many more. We've got hundreds and hundreds of TEDx organizers around the world working on it. But you know, a core idea is that we need to collaborate to do things differently. And, and that if you take something like TED as a partner, they're brilliant storytellers. And one of the things we need, if we're gonna build a different future is to paint different pictures of the future. And to have a sense, it's one of the things I love about your organization is there you are talking about not just sort of mitigating a problem, but actually transforming and restoring and ending up in a much, much better place um, in 10, 20, 30 years time than we are today. So I, I see a lot of this movement building about res, in, in a sense of res, looking at the world, responding to opportunities, and above all, finding ways to partner with one another. Because all the questions that we're dealing with right now are completely interconnected and interdependent. Awesome. It's so inspiring to see how you all have adapted to the needs of the world and have created space in your platforms for climate activism and climate restoration. Awesome to see. Um, and now, exam Alexandra, we know about your personal journey and your climate strikes in front of the UN for the past two years. As a fellow Gen Z, I'm curious of how you've established yourself and found your like-minded community. Yes, so first of all, it's great to be here with you all today um, and speaking alongside such amazing change makers. Um, so I did get involved in the climate movement when I was 13. So it was very important for me to find a sense of community and support within it. And so the first thing that I really used um, and I took advantage of was uh, technology. Gen Z, what I think has made our movement so strong is we do have all of these resources like social media, um, we connect with each other through Instagram, Twitter, um, WhatsApp. There's so many different ways to get connected with other people. And so that's how I got connected with fellow organizers. And I was so fortunate to find so many people all around the world involved in this movement. And so I think that one of the most important things for me was once I got involved in the climate movement, I saw just how much we didn't see as many young people involved as there should have been. Um, there were, we, there would be climate strikes and we'd get so many people, um, but we still needed more to make our voices heard and actually make sure that we weren't getting ignored by our politicians. And so I just realized how important outreach and education are and that they are both a, an important component in this movement. And so that's what Earth Uprising focuses on my organization focuses on is um, educating young people to bring them inside this current climate movement because everyone is needed and everyone is welcomed. One, one of the most important lessons that I have learned throughout all of this is that everybody has such unique stories that they can share. Everybody has different experiences on how they're being affected by the climate crisis. And so it's so important to get all of these voices involved uh, because those are the ones that are actually going to push solutions uh, on the community level. And so it's so important that we have everybody involved. And so I just, I noticed how important when I got involved in activism, um, I just noticed that people weren't getting involved and we really had to change that because they didn't know the science and the social justice aspects of climate change. And I think that that is one of the responsibilities that we as an organization have at Earth Uprising is to provide that education. And so I think the last component really um, that 
I've learned is that nature is definitely doing outreach for our movement um, because it's becoming more and more obvious that we are in a climate change world. The entire West Coast is on fire. I'm actually originally from Northern California and I was there throughout the entire fires the past couple of weeks. And so I ended up getting really sick. And so I have family in New York City and I was grateful enough to be able to come out here to stay safe from the fires. And so I just, one thing that's very upsetting about California's wildfires is that not enough people know about what is happening and how to stay safe. A lot of people don't realize that this is climate change fueled. And so once people are starting to see what's happening like on the West Coast with the worst air quality, and we have eight storms right now in the Atlantic at once, and some of them are growing into hurricanes. So nature right now is sounding the alarm for so many people, and that's what's pushing people to want to get more involved. And that's how we are establishing ourselves is because we find our motivation from how we're being affected. And a lot of us are angry and we want to do something. And that's where we really find our spot in this movement. So interesting that you mentioned technology and how interconnected it is. It's a great and amazing component in climate activism and also how Earth Uprising is tapping into education and really teaching people about climate activism as kind of sort of the last missing piece. Um, so that's super amazing to hear. Um, and now we are thrilled to see similar momentum around climate restoration as part of the critical part of climate action, along with mitigation and adaption. Tech Countdown is specifically related to the urgency we face. Lindsay, can you please describe how Ted Countdown came to be and the exciting plans you have in store from now until COP26? Also, what is the role of restoration in this journey? Sure, yeah, very happy to. Um, well, as I described a little bit earlier, I, I sort of started to hatch this plot together with the TED team back last summer, and we then brought together their efforts, their skills with Future Stewards and the network that I was already you know, part of. Um, and the, the core idea is to take the power of storytelling and to be very, very solution focused. So at what we're trying to do is to share with the world the science in very accessible ways. So share where are we, what is really going on, what is really happening, to do that in a way that is that really recognizes the interconnectedness of all of these issues. Uh, you know, in, in Rick's opening remarks, he talked about intersectionality, uh, just the sense that so many of the issues we're facing, you know, justice, fairness, health, you know, the climate crisis is also a health crisis, for example, that these things are all connected. So bring that to life for people, but then show the very real solutions that are already exist. We know a huge amount of what we need to do to address climate change and to reverse the, the damage that we've done to the planet or pause, halt and reverse the damage we've done to the planet. So bring that to life in the form of stories. So we're launching on 10, 10, 2020. Everybody's invited, accessible, free via YouTube. Just have to go to countdown.ted.com. So the whole world is invited to join us. Uh, we have a five and a half hour program. Um, so really a rich feast of TED Talks, animations, music, artists, um, interviews and so forth that really take people on a journey of where are we and, and how do we go about solving this problem. Um, and that includes what needs to happen at the policy level and from businesses and investors and cities and all the different players, philanthropists and others, big voice for, for youth and, and different movements. Um, and also for everyday citizens, you know, what is it that we each can do? We'll be launching that day um, a big global initiative that we've created in partnership with many, many others to invite citizens around the world to take personal steps. Uh, and we're really seeking to, to make a very big splash with that and engage through multiple organizations to enable people to take steps in their own life and then aggregate those and see how it adds up to make a difference. So we start with a big launch. We're working very closely with the um, COP26 folks, so the team that are getting ready for the UN conference next fall uh, that will take place in Glasgow in November 21. And we'll be doing more TED style work on the way there, a lot of other activities and culminating in a big summit just before the UN conference, focused three days 
the amplified around the world through TEDx of solutions. So that's a in a in a a quick potted story. Mine is that everybody's invited to participate, and and what we're trying to do is to bring new people in. Some of you have touched on people who have not thought much about this, who, who have not paid attention, or don't know very much about it, and make it really accessible to people and personal, and do that in a way that's solutions orientated and optimistic, but clearly from a clear-eyed perspective. Awesome. I love that Ted really capitalizes off of the storytelling method. And that's how you engage with your audience to spread different messages. And then also using technology to broaden your reach um, and communicating these different important movements like climate restoration. Yeah, actually, I, do, you, I missed your point on restoration. I, I want to emphasize a lot of what we'll be sharing is around restoration and how we decarbonize and take ourselves back to the healthier climate that we need. So a lot of those kinds of Absolutely. Um, and so, Melissa, congratulations on Girl Up's 10-year anniversary. The organization has seen amazing growth from a grassroots movement to a global organization and has expanded the ways in which you engage around adolescent girl empowerment. Climate change has now become an emerging issue for Girl Up. Can you provide some background on how this came to be? Yeah, thank you so much, Ashley. And actually, I would be remiss to say that Alexandra has actually been a part of this conversation at Girl Up. She was one of the highlighted speakers at our 2019 summit the last time we were in person and actually came back highly ranked as one of the favorite conversations. So I think that shows how important climate is um, to the Girl Up community. And I think that this is just inherently part of the fact that so many of these issues that are social justice issues today are interconnected. You know, we, we are all humans. You have a panel of women who both experience gender inequalities, are affected by climate, are affected by various different aspects of injustice and inequality, and yet we all live on this world in our own unique way. And so what we've really been hearing from our Girl Up community um, for the last few years is that as a human on this planet, this is an issue that we care about. We know there are gender dynamics to almost every issue that we face in the world. And so with our goal of working to achieve gender equality, climate plays a role in that. And our, our Girl Up Girl leaders who are young activists, care about social impact, are educated, are using technology, just like we've heard Ashley and Alexandra talk about, this is core to who they are and what they care about. And so even though we haven't tackled climate change, you know, as a key pillar of Girl Up, it has always been in the tertiary of what we've been doing, because we all actually live in this world, and we're all experiencing um, what is happening. I was speaking to one of our Girl Up Teen Advisor alums right now who lives in rural Oregon, and she cannot leave her house. She, she literally cannot leave her house, and so she's also a climate activist, and this, this doesn't, it's not separate from gender equality. And I think that that's really what this is all about. And as I mentioned before, listening to our community has been the thing that has propelled Girl Up forward, continued to grow our, our movement into this global presence. And our girls are actively pushing, asking and demanding that we start talking about educating and rallying behind this movement um, for climate change, for climate restoration, and really just becoming part of the conversation. So, you know, I'm super excited to be in this conversation with you all today. I'm learning so much. Um, and so many of our Girl Up leaders have been in this movement before the Girl Up community has followed. So, you know, where are Girl Up leaders we follow, where they go, where they lead us, that's where we go. And I think it's been this rallying cry of individual people, right? That's really where the power of the movement comes into play. That's where the power of social change happens is when many different individuals come together, lock their voice, and get organizations, companies, leaders, 
um, to pay attention. And I will say that that has happened right inside of Girl Up. And um, I'm paying attention. Our leadership is paying attention. Our staff, our partners, our community. Um, we hear our girls, and and we are you know moving in this direction because really we have to. Because what is an equal world if it's on fire? If it's under barrage from from you know the climate reaching out, as Alexandra said. We can't achieve equality if we're also living in an unhealthy, unsafe planet that has, you know, been devastated by our, our actions. So it really comes down to fundamentally what we're all fighting for. Absolutely love that you mentioned the interconnectedness of gender equality and climate activism because it is, it is interconnected and I think that more awareness should be brought to that. Um, and I'm so glad that we have powerful women like Alexandra and the rest of the Girl Up leaders to speak about these important topics and to really lead the way on climate activism. Um, and I think that's a perfect segue into my next question for Alexandra. As a part of your own journey, climate restoration is an emerging message along with other climate actions. How have you found the most effective way to spread this message for your community? And what are your plans to do more? Yes, so that's a great question. I think that climate restoration is one of the most important solutions we have for our changing planet. Um, you know, I am actually really hopeful to see that Joe Biden put climate restoration at the top of his climate platform as well, because that's the intention with his climate conservation corps, which would provide jobs for our generation to restore the climate. One thing that as a young person, I'm always looking towards is how can I find a job in the future that will allow me to help restore our planet? Because as some of you may know, um, climate change will impact my generation in every aspect of our life cycle. In the future, it's going to affect where we live, what kind of careers we'll have, um, and all sorts of different aspects as well. A lot of young people are deciding whether or not they even want to have a family. And these are conversations that we are starting to have, which we fr quite frankly should not be having to have at this age. And so I think that that is one reason why it's very important for us to have a say and be able to actually work towards restoring the climate. And so I also think that the most effective way to spread the message about climate restoration is to also support young people in getting out and working in their communities now. See, Earth Uprising, along with several other Gen Z organizations, such as One Up Action, um, promote and organize community-based mitigation efforts, so which teaches young people about climate restoration, but it also just goes to show that there is no better way for us to learn than just jumping in and getting started and doing the work. Awesome. Um, that is a perfect segue into our next segment for Q&A. And I'd like to bring our F4CR staff member, Kai, to lead us into that session. Um, and so I'd like to thank you all for answering these questions as we head into our next session. Hi, everyone. Uh, amazing discussion. And I loved the, the feedback and the, the dynamic voices to this area that is so new, but burgeoning and really excited for what 2020 and 2021 uh, have in store. Let me start with a question for you, Ashley, as you've been asking the questions, let me ask you a question. And I think there's people watching us that are curious about your origin and your connectedness to this work with the Foundation for Climate Restoration and Climate Restoration broadly. Do you mind sharing your origin story with us? Yes, of course. Um, so for me, it started last year when I went to their first annual summit um, about climate restoration. And it was the first time that I'd ever heard about restoration. I knew about mitigation and I'd know to, I've known about adaption, but I was introduced to this whole new world of restoration where we can actually restore our climate and restore our earth. And to me, that really stuck out and gave me hope and just maybe want to spread this message, spread this awareness that there is a way that we can get back to a healthy level that the earth can live in and that 
all of our inhabitants and animals and people can live in. And so it's just really powerful to see that there are tangible solutions that the foundation is working for. Um, and I'm super excited to see the world really, really grab, join hands um, and get involved with this movement. Great. Well, on behalf of the organization, I'm thrilled to be working with you and to have you and your leadership and your creativity as part of the organization. So, so thank you. Um, there's a question here for, for Lindsay. And the question is about the messaging of Countdown. Uh, how would we move beyond the prevailing wake up to the emergency and avoid the worst consequences to allowing hope and a restored and safe and healthy future? Can you talk a little bit about that tone of, uh, of Countdown? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things that the world is learning is that a lot of climate communications actually hasn't been very successful in the sense that, frankly, it's a community sort of talking to itself of people who are already convinced there's a problem and our ability to engage many, many more people in, in a sense of um, understanding and engagement and a sense of possibility and hope is crucial. And actually you don't get sustained attention with, with just sort of endless bad news and bleakness. People switch off and, and get very depressed. So the focus is very much on hope. It is very much on painting a picture of the future. Of course, we start, I, one of the things that will happen right at the beginning of, of what we're sharing on 1010 is, is some fantastic scientific update on where is the planet. And that is a very tough, tough viewing, but really super informative in terms of planetary boundaries and so on. Uh, but then we've got to paint a picture of the future. And part of what we're describing is that change actually happens much faster than people realize once you go over tipping points. Now, some of that can be very grim in terms of, you know, tipping points on our planet as we discover that, you know, things are getting worse much faster than we realize. But as we've seen with things like, you know, the price of solar and the spread of solar power and, and many other dimensions, um, positives can also happen very fast. So they talk in terms of um, how that development looks at, as an S, S curve, where it swoops up because of exponential growth. And so part of what we're going to be sharing with people is just how quickly many of the positive changes that we need can actually take place, which I think people often find hard to imagine. So very much the spirit of painting a picture of, of our world in five years and 10 years and 20 years that is not doom laden, um, but that shows what can happen uh, if we get on and take action. Final thing I'll say, which I, I know most people listening to this call will be well aware of, you know, it's not so much, I mean, we do need new technologies and so on to deal with some of the challenges that we've got, but, but a lot of what we need to do, we already know. And the issue is, is, you know, human will, leadership, policy, citizen activation, business activation. I am personally seeing extraordinarily rapid change as different groups realize, and many of our panelists have already described this, you know, we are this is really happening and it's happening faster than we expected and more and more people are waking up to that um, and consequently i think there's a huge opportunity for people to step up boldly um, and we need to paint a picture of just how wonderful clean cities 15 minute city what does that mean what can that look like what can the experience be like um, so that's part of what we're trying to share with people I love it. And I think I've been lucky enough to have an inside look at what the, the speakers that are participating in Countdown on 1010 and, and beyond. And um, I think everyone will be thrilled with the participation and the message that's coming from all of these groups and voices around certain topics and areas that I think that'll be relatable for global communities. Alexandria, a question for you in terms of movement and progress against that movement. It's about a year ago to the day, maybe a week or so off when Children versus Climate Crisis uh, submitted that petition um, to the world. It was you and a lot of global peers, uh, including one notable Greta Thunberg as part of this. I'd love if you could share some of the updates. First, maybe give a little bit about what that was, that petition, and then progress that we've seen over the year. Yes, so it's very interesting to think that a year ago today was the September 20th climate strike, the United right. Nations Youth Climate Summit, and just all of these incredible announcements. And so one of the announcements that I was a part of is um, myself, Greta Thunberg, and 
14 other children ended up filing a complaint to the Committee of the Rights of the Child at the United Nations saying that five countries were violating our rights by their inaction on the climate crisis. And so those countries are Argentina, Brazil, Germany, Turkey, and France. And so why some people ask, why, well, why those five? Why didn't you do the US in it? Well, the United States, first of all, did not ratify the rights of the child, which in my opinion is um, bogus. Uh, but I also think that um, why it, the reason why it's those five countries is because they ratified the rights of the child, but they also ratified um, saying that ratified something saying that if they are not upholding these commitments, then we are able to hold them accountable. And so that was one of the protocols that they ended up ratifying. And so we are actually going to be holding them accountable right now because the rights of the child says that young people um, have an inherent right to life. And right now, the climate crisis is directly impacting that. And so um, there was actually a documentary that came out um, just a week ago that followed myself um, and three other activists um, in this complaint from Alaska, the Marshall Islands, and Africa. And so in this documentary, it follows our stories and how we're being affected by the climate crisis. Because what was very impactful about having children from all around the world is that all of us were being impacted by the climate crisis differently, but all of our rights were being um, threatened by the climate crisis. And so um, that documentary, I think one thing that I really hope that happens from it and from the complaint in general is that it just raises awareness and more young people see how their rights are being violated by their politicians and people in power by them not acting on the climate crisis. And I hope that that makes them want to do something and start to take action. And so right now, um, the complaints, it's been a year and um, right now it has been passed and it's admissible. So what we're waiting for now is for those five countries to respond to our complaint. And so I'm sure they're going to respond. And if they don't in a timely manner, we're just going to keep pushing them until they do. Yeah, no, no surprise there that you will keep pushing. That's fantastic. Congratulations on all that you've done. Also a quick question, that documentary you mentioned, I think everyone watching would be interested. How would one find it? Yes, so it's, um, Earth, it's an Earth-focused documentary and it's on KCET. Okay, I know KCET. And we will, for everyone watching, we'll certainly uh, share the link uh, where people can, can find it. Great, thank you. A uh, question came through for you, Melissa, which is, and maybe for the panel, but I'll start with Melissa. Um, certainly the, on these movements, uh, what are we doing, what is Girl Up doing to engage other youth, rest, other youth and, and gender movements and organizations across the world? Yeah, thank you, Kai. I mean, I think that what, what we're seeing here and even in this conversation with Ashley, with Alexandra, with Lindsay, with, with the Foundation for Climate Restoration, and Lindsay spoke about this before, is it, it takes all of us. Not, there's not one single organization that can tackle any, any issue. So when we talk about you know, adolescent girls' rights and opportunities and equality, we don't do that by ourselves. We have worked over the last 10 years in this, in this much larger community. And when you talk about youth, youth are not monolithic. There's not like an issue that affects youth, but the rest don't. Because again, like we've been saying, we're all humans in this world and we all bring our identities with us, whether that's age or gender or nationality or you know many of the other factors that, that this plays out. So I think working across other youth organizations is just, it's, it's, it's like you have to do it that way. Um, and I think for, for any issue, for any movement, um, if you're just talking to adults, you're not going to see the change that you need. If you're only talking to youth, then you've left out the people who are actually still in the positions of power, who are frankly still accountable to making things better. It is not actually on a generation of 13 and 16 year olds to fix the world for the rest of us. We all still have a role in this. And so, you know, I think that intergenerational, as much as inter intersectional issue collaborations are crucial. So every, every movement has a youth com component because, because we also know youth are really good at activism. They always have been. They always push us where we need to go. And so I think the youth voice 
wherever you can find it is, is a very important one. But I also think it's really important to make sure that we're not passing the baton before our turn is up. And, and that's really important when you're working with youth, that as adults, as leaders, that they see us still working side by side with them. Um, and I think you know that cross collaboration comes through in, in so many of those ways. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Um, question for, I think, for our Gen Zs, Ashley and Alexandra, and I'll start with you, Ashley. Um, from, you know, since you've been engaged in the climate fights and climate action, is there any groups or voices that you think have been largely absent and that need to be engaged further in order for this to truly be an intersectional movement? Ashley? Um. Yeah, I will say that I'm very, very proud of the movement that we're heading in and that a lot of major political figures are um, introducing climate restoration into their political agendas. As Alexandria mentioned, Joe Biden is now making that a priority, which is amazing to see. And I do think that he shouldn't be the only one. We need all political figures to make this a priority, uh, all corporations and large businesses. Um, a lot of the bodies that can make a lot of change and implement climate restorative technologies needs to make this a priority and needs to spread the word and spread the awareness along with us, along with the youth. Um, and that I think, I think that will really catalyze our movement. Great, thank you. Alexandra, do you have any thoughts on that, that question? Definitely. So um, I think that in the climate movement, there have been a lot of voices that definitely need to be heard more and are uplifted even more. And the main voices that I believe are indigenous voices and people who are being impacted by the climate crisis the most, of course. Um, I was actually at COP in Madrid. Um, and one thing that I was very disappointed about was the lack of rep representation um, of indigenous voices and those in the global south, because those are the ones who are going to be able to work on the solutions. And indigenous people have been taking care of our planet for generations. And so they are the ones that have the solutions and they need to be the ones in those rooms um, having conversations with those in power. And so I'm actually on the youth advisory for the next COP. And one thing that I'm going to constantly be pushing for is making sure that those voices are represented because they are the ones who know what we need to do and the solutions we need to implement. Great, thank you, Alexander. That's so true. I happened to be at the Global Climate Action Summit, I guess that was in 2018 in, in, in San Francisco, and the indigenous voices came out loudly and clearly saying, we didn't create this mess, <laughs> certainly, but we're happy to be part of the conversation, use what we know and our connected, connectedness with the planet to find solutions. So I think that's such a spot on comment. Thank you, Alexandria. Lindsay, we have a robust climate restoration audience with us today. So a question for you is, we spoke about 10, 10, 10, people have now seen the speakers, maybe tease a little bit about what the countdown and the roadmap looks like and opportunities for perhaps the restoration community to get involved. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so one of the things that's going on behind the scenes that I'll describe, so we're working very closely with the COP team and there's a particular group called the Climate Champions led by Nigel Topping, whose role reporting into the UN and, and the British government are responsible for, for Glasgow for the, for the meeting, is to engage with all the non-state actors. So everybody's not a country, so cities, regions, different groups, the youth group that Alexandra was just mentioning, uh, business and so and one of the things that they're doing is looking at each of the sectors that need transforming. You know, we need to transform how we, uh, energy evidently, the whole energy sector needs transforming to renewable and clean. We need to transform transportation. Uh, you know, we need to dramatically accelerate uh, electrification of all forms of transportation. We need to transform our food and agriculture system. We need to transform uh, our nature-based solutions and the way in which we use nature and the space that we make for nature. Uh, we need to transform how we look after our options and so forth. And in all of those domains, then what is the system, all the different facets, or as many as one can explore, look like to affect systemic change? Um, I think that's really powerful work, which actually typically hasn't been done before. And as you do that, you really look at, at, at the many different pieces that need to come together to transform our economies, to transform the way in which we make things, to transform the ways in which we live. Um, 
and to transform the ways in which we move and to transform how we engage with, with nature. So one of the things I would say is that there's a very strong system, systemic change lens that we're bringing to the actually how do we get the job done of taking our emissions down to zero and then net zero and then start absorbing emissions back to take our climate back to where it was. And there's a great deal of practical change that needs to happen, of innovation that needs to happen to enable all of that. And we're wanting to tell those stories. So, you know, if you tune in, for example, on 1010, you will see us talking about what does it look like to, put, to have massive reforestation. You'll see us also talking about what does it mean to, to reinvent how we make buildings, to reinvent cement, which is a very carbon intensive product, for example, and to think differently about construction in the future. So we're trying to be very thoughtful about the, the detail of getting the job done and all the different actors across society who, are need, who need to be engaged. The final thing I'll say is I think the problem of, of climate in, in many ways is a problem of consciousness. This is really about us being aware of our complete interdependence on one another and on all of nature. And that if we're not restoring and taking care of nature, of course, it can't, can't take care of us. So for me, a big piece of this is about that waking up and one of the things that's so exciting to me just listening to this conversation is the, the kind of waking up that's going on all over the world, including that that's being led by a new generation of young people who I think are approaching this with a profound level of consciousness, of awareness. Um, and that's part of what needs to happen for all of us, for us to step into a different relationship with our environment. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm, I'm really excited for the next 12 to 14 months, knowing that our organizations will be working together to get this, this story told. We only have a couple minutes left, but there's one question I want to ask the panel, and I'll start with you, Melissa, with the question of climate justice. Certainly gender equality and, and, and justice in that realm has been the focus for the organization, but I'd love for you, and then I'll hand it over to the others, to speak to that specific topic. How is Girl Up working or have plans to work on, on climate justice. Melissa? Thanks, Kai. I think, you know, it, it's been an, a recent evolution, right? With just sort of the state of the world today, um, the movements that are rising around injustices all over the world. And, you know, we, we've been on a fight for gender, <laughs> gender justice, equality, really talking about rights, right? When you talk about justice, you're talking about rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, as we are following a younger, bolder, more connected and more conscious, which I think is such a great way to put it, generation, this isn't about just the right thing to do, it's about fairness. And I think that when you think about fairness, there are people in power who make decisions that impact the lives of people who are not in power. For Girl Up, for a long time, that was a patriarchal power, right? But as humanity, and as we all sit with this distribution of power, justice is about fairness. We all exist in this world as humans. And so from, from the Girl Up leaders that I hear from every day, what they are fighting for is fairness in, in any issue in the way that impacts not only them, but their peers, other girls, other humans. And so I think when we think about so many of the things we're thinking about today, we've actually shifted almost fully to the idea of justice and fairness and what is right. Um, and less of this like feel good, we should just do this because it's the right thing, but actually it is the right thing because it is the just and fair thing. So that's how we've been really thinking about justice. Great, I love that, Melissa. And not surprised coming with the origins of, of Girl Up and the work that you've done so well. Um, we're unfortunately at time. Uh, I'm leaving this panel extremely motivated by the opportunities. I have two young daughters who are, I, I'm lucky to have four brilliant young women for them to look up to, along with their mother and many others. Um, leaving this uh, motivated, I just wanted to go back to those group of young people to hear what's motivating them uh, and, and, and close out this session. But before I do, I just wanted to say thank you, Lindsay, Alexandria, Melissa, Ashley, for moderating such a dynamic session. Uh, look forward to staying in touch and hearing from you all. Um, and if we could roll that video and then you'll hear from Rick. Thank you all.
coming from Africa, I must tell you that I have the privileges of experiencing wildlife, seeing the glory of God, um, seeing the glory of, you know, nature, the beauty of it. You know, we have the mighty Victoria Falls just uh, some kilometers away. Since uh, So these are some of the things that has led me to dreaming more and wanting more and aspiring to share this with the world and keep it rather than destroying it ensure that everybody enjoys that so these are some of the things that motivated and the hope that some other young people would contribute better one of the key parts for motivation for me is um being able to have grown up and witness this movement take such gain such traction um, we see all around the world people taking action um, and gaining more awareness at the most simplest level gaining awareness for this issue and its devastating effects that it will have on our future and that is currently having on our present lives um, and so I'm excited to see different organizations that aren't necessarily just focusing on the sort of three legs of the stool again with climate action, with mitigation or adaptation, but now with restoration. And so we see there is a, there is a sort of shared sentiment of hope. Our future is not bleak. It is not inevitable. We no longer have the time to be passive about this movement. We actually need this love and excitement and motivation towards change and movement towards change and i find that the climate restoration movement does that it brings movement towards hope i don't know what the future holds but down the line i want to say that i made a difference i want to say that i pushed for bold yet achievable solutions and i want to say that i stood up for the planet and all those that inhabit it we are the first generations to see the impacts of climate change and the last generation that can stop it as such, it's not only our prerogative, but our moral responsibility to do so. And I can only hope that others will follow in our footsteps. My future and the futures of my peers depends on the actions we take today to remove all the carbon we have put in the air for the last 200 years. Join me in the urgent fight to save our earth, to restore our climate. Wow. I hope everyone watching is as inspired as I am about the future. People ask me often why I do the work that I do. You just saw it. Thank you, Ashley and Kai. Thank you to our speakers, Lindsay, Alexandra, and Melissa, and to our special, special messages from Brooke and Jesse, who are youth ambassadors for the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Danielle from Girl Up and Jade from Broadway Green Alliance and John Bertrand from Earth Day. I hope everyone joining us is just really consumed with passion about the actions that the communities worldwide are making around climate action and social justice. The impacts of climate change are evident before our eyes, which can feel overwhelming. It's certainly motivational to know that young people around the world will not stand for the status quo and are demanding change, and that platforms like Girl Up, Earth Day Work, and Countdown provide vehicles for those wanting action to participate in the fight. It requires this level of leadership and action. It will require partnerships. We have to work together to ensure that we have a sustainable and healthy planet for future generations to thrive. We have one more se session for you in which we'll reflect on the highlights from these past two days. I hope you'll join us on Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern to conclude this year's forum and that you'll join us for the next year and for the third annual Global Climate Restoration Forum. Join us on Friday to learn more about how all this comes together and how we will be launching the road to Glasgow. Please follow us on uh, all the social media. Please follow us at the foundation of climate restoration.org. Let me say a very, very special thanks to our forum underwriters, the Peter J and Sharon D. Fikowski Trust and our friends at Guggenheim Partners. As I've said throughout, without their support, the forum just would not be possible. Again, join us for our final session where we will wrap all of this together on Friday at 1 p.m. See you then.